this uh, short course on uh, uh, dynamic learning, specifically on data-driven optimization in pricing and revenue management. Um, just a quick reminder, uh, tomorrow it will be our last session and it's gonna be a seminar, which I will be giving on sequential testing and diffusion approximation. So as opposed to the, to some extent, the frequentist approach of Arnu on learning, I'll take more a Bayesian approach uh, to that. All right, so uh, Arnu, thank you for uh, being with us and the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Victor, and uh, hello, everyone. Welcome in this uh, online Zoom room for uh, the third session in this mini course on data-driven optimization in pricing and revenue management. Uh, thanks again to Victor for the organization. Um, and before I start, uh, just as uh, the other sessions, if you have a question, feel free to unmute and interrupt me, or you can also write it in the chat. I don't read the chat. Uh, because I look at the slides, but then probably Victor will notify me. Okay, so the previous lecture, we discussed dynamic pricing with learning in case there are inventory constraints. And we discussed the question of model selection in a data-driven setting when you are not primarily interested in say statistical goals, but you're interested in earning money. What are good models and why is it that simple models sometimes do better than uh, complex models? Now, that was last time. This lecture, I want again to treat two topics. One is assortment optimization with learning. And the second one is uh, I want to spend some time just briefly on uh, what people are doing nowadays in research on pricing and revenue management with learning. That will not be exhaustive, but just to get an overview of uh, the field. And uh, maybe some of you are PhD students who are, have to choose a topic that can be helpful. And otherwise just to get an impression, what are the type of things that people are working on nowadays in this field. But first I want to discuss the assortment optimization problem with learning. Now, if you have attended the previous lectures, then you will uh, know that assortment optimization is one of the central problems in revenue management. And it consists of determining from a set of products, uh, which subset you offer to consumers in order to maximize revenue. Now, this is basically a kind of abstracted problem that appears in revenue management. Uh, for example, in airline revenue management, where people have to decide which fare classes are available and which are not, uh, display optimization, classical uh, shelf optimization, what do you put as a retailer on your shelf, uh, just in the brick and mortar store. All these kinds of problems has to have an assortment optimization flavor. Now, the last time we discussed model selection, in this case, model selection is very important. Because you can imagine if you have N products and you offer a subset, well, if you, there are N over K ways to offer a, a set of K products, and for each possible assortment, there can be a probability distribution. And what's the probability that the consumer chooses uh, product K? Now, if you offer K products, then there are K probabilities, they sum to one. So the, the no purchase probability is canceled out. So for 10 products, that's already more than 5,000. And for 20 products, that is more than 10 million parameters. So if you don't impose any structure, then this problem will be difficult, uh, both optimization and estimation. So the nice thing about this problem is that it is obvious that we need to simplify. We need to impose some assumptions. Now, having no assumptions at all is indeed a bit odd because then strange things can happen. Um, yes, now, this is the field of choice models, and uh, that's a very nice feed. How do consumers choose? Uh, so you can approach this empirically. What are good descriptions of how people choose from options, given the attributes of options? But you can also study this more from a performance viewpoint, which models uh, perform best, irrespective of whether they have good prediction capabilities. Now, and what we saw last time is that our uh, MNL choice model uh, sometimes performs very well. So in the MNL choice model, there are only N parameters, capital N if I have 
end products. The intrinsic valuation or attractiveness value is sometimes called. And the choice probability is just proportional to the product valuation. That's the MNL model. Now, this model has several drawbacks. I assume that the red bus, blue bus paradox has been treated in one of the earlier lectures. There's just a very limited substitution behavior that you can model by this approach. But as we uh, saw uh, and discussed last time, that doesn't necessarily matter. Now, there are many extensions of the MNL choice model, nested logic, niche logic, uh, Markov chain, etc. And determining what is a good model is, yeah, an important question. Today in the lecture, we will just discuss the assortment optimization under the most simple model, the MNL choice model, but with the twist that we don't know these product valuations. So these are unknown, we need to learn them from data. So let's make it a little bit more formal. These valuations are called V1 up to Vn. And we have a dynamic setting where the seller offers an assortment ST uh, at each time period and from some feasible set. Um, okay, so this is a typo. The feasibles, so the assortment is, of course, from the set of feasible products. Um, now, then one consumer arrives, so uh, time periods are assumed to be so small that just one consumer arrives with high probability, or you can assume that after a consumer arrives, you can change the assortment again. If I offer assortment S, then the probability of choosing I is VI divided by the sum of the VJs in S plus one, and the normalized attractiveness value of the no purchase option purchases nothing with the remaining probability. Now, if the customer chooses product I, then the seller earns revenue RI. So uh, we call this revenue, but you can easily incorporate marginal cost, of course, in, uh, in RI. Our revenue function, which we try to maximize, is this function. It's a function of our assortment, S, so that's a set, and a function of V, this vector of attractiveness uh, values. So it's the sum over all product of the revenue of product I times the probability that this product is purchased. Now, this is what we aim to optimize. Um, there are several variants uh, related to the constraints. So what I here try to type, but there is a typo, is that you can include constraints on the sets that you can offer. The most simple case is that you can offer any subset of your products. Uh, there's also the version where you can offer at most, you can offer at most K products for some K. And there are much more complicated variants. For example, if you offer product one, you also want to offer product two, things like this. But today we will just study the most simple variants with and without this capacity constraint. Now let's first think about the full information solution. This is also perhaps something that has already been treated, but for because not everybody maybe may have seen it or remembered, I will just repeat it. Namely, the solution to this problem um, under full information. So if we know this vector v, what should we do? Well, there are many sets at two to the power n if you have uh, n products, but nevertheless, the structure is uh, very easy and it's a very simple optimization problem. Now you can see that by this classical argument, I want to maximize my revenue function. So what does that mean? I need to find a value rho such that there is an assortment with revenue at least rho. And then I want to make rho as big as possible. This is the same as just maximizing. You try to find the best lower bound. Now, you see here in the denominator these terms, I can bring those to the right and then I can subtract. And then you have that this is equivalent to that this sum is at least rho. Now, the next step is that the existence of such a set is equivalent to that the maximum of this expression is at least rho because uh, the set of feasible assortment is just finite. Now, if you look at this inner maximization problem, you see that it's uh, not so difficult. How do I maximize this? I need to select products I. Uh, well, what I of course do is I select all products such that Ri is more than rho. 
because then I contribute positively to the sum. If I select, if I include products with marginal revenue less than rho, then I make this smaller. So clearly, uh, this inner maximization problem is solved by an assortment of the form over all products with revenue at least rho. Now, and then that also holds for the for the, the auto optimization problem. We just have to find rho, but this structure remains. So we know that the optimal assortment is of the form offer all products with uh, price or revenue at least some value. Now, now suppose that these these are unknown. What should we do? So we make a small assumption. Um, we make namely an assumption on the choice on the no purchase probability. That is this object. We assume some lower bound for this. That is just for technical reasons. Um, and you can choose E0, uh, very small. But usually in assortment optimization, uh, the probability of no purchasing is quite high. In practice. Now, uh, I have already discussed in the first uh, session like a formal definition of a policy, but what we need to find is an assortment for each possible data set that we can have at hand. And the data set is all the assortments that we have already offered and the corresponding purchases. So that's a policy and uh, in particular, each assortment of course cannot depend on the future, but only on what you have already seen. Now the quality of a policy is measured by the regret. So if I would know V, I would just uh, be able to solve this maximization problem and this is what I would earn. I don't know V, so I offer this set assortments as T for all time periods. And this is what I earn in capital T time periods in expectation. The difference is my loss. That depends on my policy, which we did not buy, eh, which basically determines how I select my assortments on the time horizon and on the unknown V. So what we also look at often is the worst case we get where I just take a supremum over all uh, these unknown vectors in some set of uh, feasible vectors. Now that's the setting we are studying. Um, yes. If there are any questions on the model, uh, feel free to ask. Otherwise we proceed to how to solve it. Yes, so I uh, mentioned that the optimal assortment is to offer the K most expensive products. Uh, all products with price at least some value, so that's equivalent to the K most expensive products. So expensive means price or revenue. We use it uh, interchangeably in this parameter Ri. Uh, so we need to, or decision is, some, is a K from one up to N. Now we can use what is called multi armed bandit techniques. Um, yeah, that's a, a standard framework where you have K uh, fruit machines, slot machines, you pull an arm uh, and then you earn some random reward and you want to find, uh, you want to maximize your earnings. And then you get the kind of exploration exploitation trade-off where on the one hand you want to try different arms to learn about their expected rewards and on the other hand you want to zoom in on the action on the arm that appears to be best. Now you can do that. Uh, there are results in the literature that says that in uh, the optimal multi-arm bandit policies have a regret of a worst case regret of a constant time square root nt. So n is the number of products and t is the time horizon. Uh, Arnoud, just to be clear. Uh, yes. So you mean that we have n arms and then you're, you're trying to find an algorithm to learn the k largest because you don't care about the ranking, per se, like which one is the highest. You want the k largest. Yes. Yes. So there are n arms and arm k means I offer the k most expensive products. Arm one is I offer the most expensive product. Yes, uh, arm two is I offer um, 
the two most expensive products. I now realize that maybe there are tie breakers. The then, the arms. Yes. You, so you is that your question? What if uh, if there's a tie break? If they are equally expensive? No, no, no. But I just want to make sure that um, that so you this is in this case the the arms are are correlated. Uh, yes, there is some underlying structure, indeed. So. The, well, the, they are not correlated in the sense that uh, I can offer the most expensive product and the two most expensive products. They are both independent realizations from different uh, distributions. In that sense, they are not correlated. But of course, there is this underlying MNL structure uh, that tells me something. I hope that answers your question. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, so basically, the what we're learning is the V's, right? So in 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 one branch we have, uh, you know, one branch is, has a V1, let's say, and another branch has a V1, V2, and a third a third arm, sorry, third arm will have V1, yes, V3, right? So that from yes, that yes. sense, I'm saying it's correlated. It's like yes, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's uh, correct indeed, and that are the same underlying V's, V1, V2, V3. Yes. Now, you can do this, uh, and I realize that there are some tie-breaking issues. Uh, what if multiple products are equally expensive? Uh, but fortunately, we don't have to go in there because uh, the question is, can you do better than the standard multi bandit approach? And the answer is yes. So we don't need to think about uh, these tie-break issues. You can namely do uh, much better. There is a policy with a regret that scales like square root D that is independent of the number of products. Well, and if uh, the number of products is large, then that of course is potentially a big improvement. This was shown in a paper by Chen and Wang. In Wang, uh, so the official version is used out. And they also show that square root T is the best you can do. Well, what they show is for one particular revenue uh, vector, they show that any policy has a worst case regret of at least a constant time square root. Oh, this is a very nice result. And what is interesting is, so this is the assortment optimization problem without capacity constraints. So that is a simpler problem than the version with constraints, but there used to be more literature on the version with constraints than without constraints, perhaps for this reason that it feels like easy. What's there to be done uh, in the unconstrained version? Just uh, use your favorite multi arm bandit uh, algorithm. But uh, Chen Wang showed no, you can do much better. Um, yes, uh, but only fairly recently. Now, I will uh, not. Uh, show their algorithm. I will show uh, an algorithm of a PhD student of mine, um, which also achieves the same regret rate. And the reason is that this algorithm is uh, very, very simple. It fits in half a slide. Uh, so for pedagogical purposes, that's better. Now, and it's based on the following observation. And so remember this argumentation I showed uh, that showed why the optimal revenue is of the form of the k most expensive products. Now, if you look at that, you see that the optimal revenue, the optimal row star satisfies uh, this equation, uh, the sum over all products with revenue at least rho, and uh, that's this solution to the inner maximization problem of ri minus rho vi is rho. Now, this is uh, by slightly reshuffling again uh, in reverse order as what I did on this slide. This means that the revenue I earn when I offer all products of at least uh, revenue row is row. So we need to solve fixed point equation. The revenue when I offer all products of at least uh, price row minus row should be zero. Now, this is a fixed point equation. Of course, I mean, this is unknown. It depends on the vector v. But if you offer an assortment, we just get uh, a realization of this. So what does this mean? You can just use a stochastic approximation. Oh. And the policy is uh, very simple. So 
This is it. What do we do? At each time moment, we offer all products with marginal revenue at least row T. Now, and we update row T just as a classical stochastic approximation recursion. The next row T is the current row T plus some parameter. Well, we choose alpha over T plus beta. And uh, this typically should satisfy some conditions that if you sum these, it should be infinite, uh, infinite, but if you sum the square, it should be finite. And because on our on, yeah, I won't go, that's like standard conditions. And multiply it by what? What is this? Well, this is the revenue that I actually earned. So the revenue of YT, the product that I purchased, uh, where a zero corresponds to the no purchase, minus my previous row T. And that's it just, I try to solve uh, this fixed point equation, or I try to find this root of this function, basically by stochastic approximation. Now, you can analyze this recursion. Uh, you just look at the error you make in terms of error at the previous time period, and then you can show a regret of square root t. So again, the square root t bound is by 10 and one, but their policy is a bit complicated. And it turns out, or uh, Peters, PhD student, Janik Peters, he uh, found this very nice, very simple solution uh, that fits on half slide. Now, and he also slightly adapted this proof of the lower bound. Uh, Channel one showed that for one particular revenue function, the regret is at least square root t. He showed that for any revenue function where the revenues are different, you can show that the regret is at least square root t. So just some small refinement. What's important is that there are algorithms that are optimal and that do not depend on the number of problems, which is, I think, quite nice. So intuitively, it doesn't depend on n because somehow you know you're looking for the upper tail and it's kind of the left tail. If it's very long, it doesn't matter. Um, yes. So there are several ways to see it, but if n is very big, so basically there's just this equation you need to uh, need to solve. Yes. So this is a function that um, yeah, there are there are, it's like uh, there are a lot of points. Yeah. But most points don't matter. Uh, only the number of products around uh, around the root they matter. You you can basically you can add a lot of uh, dummy products uh, indeed at, at the left or at the right that don't have any influence. Um, yes. Okay. So that was. Uh, the uncapacitated unconstrained assortment problem, which you can just solve by a stochastic approximation, a standard method to find uh, the root of a function. Now let's assume that we only offer assortment of size at most k for some k. So we now need to maximize our revenue function over all assortments with size at most k. Now that is a little bit more complicated but there is an LP formulation that solves this. So computationally, it's not uh, too difficult to find the optimal solution once we know V. Uh, it's not anymore true that this structure holds. Over the K most expensive product is no longer always optimal. Oh, so how are we going to estimate V from our data? Uh, you can uh, use maximum likelihood estimation that is possible. But what I want to share is a very nice observation from this paper by Agrawal, Aranadula, Goya, and Zevi. And they uh, had the following observation. Suppose I offer an assortment S for several time periods. Now, and I wait until I see a no purchase. Then I count how often I sold product I before the no purchase. Then that is geometrically distributed with parameter or with expectation VI. In particular, so what does this mean? Well, first it means uh, that it is, the distribution is independent of the other products in the assortment, uh, which of course is caused by the MNL structure. And it means that I can very easily obtain an unbiased estimator of VI. I just fix my assortment until I uh, see no purchase. And then I count how often I sold product I, and that's my estimator. Well, then I use another assortment. I uh, fix it again, 
same story. And then I can average over all my estimates I get, and uh, that works uh, very nice. So uh, computationally, I'm not sure if this uh, is the very best um, estimator in terms of the variance, but in terms of elegance, I think it's the best estimator, um, which is nice. Now, given such an estimate, what's next? Then we need to decide how are we going to set our assortments. Now, and uh, in this paper, they use an UCB approach, uh, which I think is nice to share because that's an approach that we see in many papers on data-driven optimization. And that's based on the principle of optimism. Now, this also, if you have, haven't heard of this, this is a very nice uh, principle and it's nice that it works. Let me explain this principle by a very important optimization problem. Where are we going to go for dinner? So suppose we have two options. We can go for dinner to some well-known fast food restaurant where we have been like a dozen of times. Or we can go to this new fancy place in town. Now, uh, suppose we have been very often to this fast food restaurant. We know what we can get there. So the food quality on average is this dot and the confidence interval is small. Now, maybe we've been only twice to this uh, haute cuisine. Uh, okay, the food quality was not so good, but you know, we have been there only two times. So maybe we've just been unlucky. The confidence interval is very wide. Now, if you're pessimistic, you say, let's go to the fast food restaurant because we know what we get. But if you're optimistic, you say, well, indeed, our average food quality was low, but maybe we were just unlucky. The upper tail, uh, the upper end of our confidence interval is higher than the upper end of this fast food restaurant. So we choose the, the new place. If we are lucky, the food will be good. If we are unlucky, then we are still happy because our uncertainty will shrink. Now, if you're optimistic, you can, uh, you can take decisions like this. Um, and what is nice about this principle is that it works also mathematically. Now let's apply that to this assortment optimization problem. So I said, we need to keep assortments fixed. And so we have cycles. Uh, a cycle is basically, uh, yeah, as long until the next no purchase. And then you change assortments again. Now, what do I do? I estimate uh, my VIs by just uh, the average number of purchases of each product when it was offered. Then I create a confidence, upper confidence bound. So to my mean, I add something. Now, what is this? This is something that is uh, yeah, roughly the square root of one over the number of times that I uh, that product I was offered at all. Now there's this uh, log and there's this one plus because you don't want to divide by zero, these kinds of things. Now what you see, if I offer indeed, if I offer an assortment with product I, then I increase this. Uh, so I decrease the confidence radius. So I get more knowledge, which is good. So same as uh, in the fast food uh, example. Now, what you do in each cycle, uh, so in between no purchase, you just offer the optimal assortment, assuming that your upper confidence bound vector of valuations is the correct one. Now, and if you analyze this, you can show a worst case regret bound of close to square root NT. So in this case, the we see here an N, we don't see a K, K is the capacity constraint and it's the number of products. That, now in this case, N, uh, we cannot remove it. Yeah, so this is on high level, um, this particular policy uh, based on optimism, a UCB type policy it's called. And it's good to know if you haven't heard of it because you see it a lot and it has many applications. Basically, yeah, in many data-driven optimization problems, if there's something for which you can construct an upper confidence bound, yeah, you can try uh, the UGB policy. Okay, so uh, nice regret bound, of course, the standard question. Okay, is this optimal? Uh, it is, 
this is uh, shown by Chen and Wang, the same Chen and Wang uh, from the other paper I mentioned. And again, <laughs> my student has studied this paper and tried to improve it. Now, this is about the regret lower bound. Now, I won't go into the details uh, how you prove this, but I want to show one particular aspect of it, which I think was, is nice to share. And it is the following. So suppose we have our uh, revenue parameters. Now I construct my, uh, my vector V, my attraction value as follows. It's some gamma divided by K, and the maximum number of products you can offer times Ri minus gamma. For some gamma that is sufficiently small so that this is always positive. Okay, fine. Now, what is our revenue function with this vector? Uh, so it's the sum of the Ri Vi divided by one plus the Vi's. Now let's put these values in. So gamma just comes here in front. Um, so here we have Ri and Ri over minus gamma. Now, here we have the same, but without uh, the Ri. And then I multiply everything by K and then we get here a K. Okay. Now, um, this is almost the same as this. So here I just add and subtract Ri in the numerator. Uh, there are S terms, so then I get K minus the size of S and then I have an Ri instead of a gamma in the numerator. Okay, why are we doing this? Well, now these red terms are the same. I want to optimize my uh, revenue function. Now, I want to, I, then uh, that is increasing in the red term. So I want the red term to be big. And um, also I want the size of S to be K. That optimize yeah, because I want this to be big. So I want um, this to be small. Is it correct? Okay. Yeah, I'm a bit mixing up, but indeed, uh, if I'm mixing up, let me know. The optimal assortment has size K, means over everything. And you want to make this as big as possible. No. Ah, no, sorry. Yeah, now I understand. Now that means that the optimal revenue that you earn under assortment S is just gamma. So any assortment of size K earns the same gamma. And assortment with size less than K, you earn less. Oh, sorry, I was a bit confused by this, uh, by this minus sign. What does that mean? I here have uh, uh, some vector of attractiveness values, and then any assortment of size K is optimal. Well, that's nice to know. You can always construct such a vector V given your revenues. Now, you would say, uh, well, well, how does this help us? Because this is a very simple problem. Well, what we're gonna do, we're gonna slightly perturb this base vector. So take some assortment S. Now for this assortment S, we're gonna construct a new attractiveness vector, value vector. Namely, all the values in S, we multiply by one plus epsilon for some positive small epsilon, and the rest remains the same. Now, what does that mean? We do this for every feasible assortment S. Now, and that means uh, by choosing epsilon in the right way, what will happen is that uh, you slightly increase the attractiveness of the products in S. So the optimal assortment will be to offer S. Now, so first it was optimal to offer anything. Now it's optimal to offer S, but the difference between those is very small because epsilon is small. What does that mean? If nature just chooses some uh, random Vs, uh, so Vs for some random assortment S, if epsilon is small, then it is, uh, yeah, these Vs are all more or less the same. It's difficult to learn from data which particular S nature has selected. So because that is small, the epsilon is small, we need many samples to learn which S nature actually chose. But if we are wrong in our idea of uh, what 
what as nature chose, then we may offer the wrong assortment and we lose something. Now, the loss is small. If epsilon is big, then the loss will also be larger. So the most difficult case is where epsilon is small, but not too small. You have to balance. Uh, on the one hand, you want to make epsilon small so that statistically it's difficult to learn what nature has done. On the other hand, you don't want epsilon to be too close to zero because then you don't lose anything when you select a suboptimal assortment. Now that's the basic idea of these lower bound and also this lower bound. And then, uh, yeah, kubak liber diverges inequalities and some other things. Uh, you can then derive the square root and t lower bound. For details, look at the paper. Um, Interestingly, that's only if k is at most n over 2. The other case is still open if your k is bigger than n over 2. But uh, what is nice is that you can construct a base case for which any assortment is optimal. And you slightly perturb that to create a difficult instance uh, that for which the attractiveness values are very close to each other. Now. That's about this policy. A few remarks. But this is just one quick question, Arno. Is okay. Yes. Um, so you don't try to learn the V's, you mean? You try to learn directly the S? Yes. That's the point. Yes, you try to learn the optimal assortment. But if nature selects, say nature selects this set of products uh, and they uh, multiply by one plus epsilon, uh, and for this product, nature this just multiplied by one, or the other way around, then it in this case, this is the optimal assortment, and I shouldn't offer this. And in the other case, it's still all the way around. Well, then for me, it's very difficult to learn which assortment is optimal because these V values are so close to each other. Mm. And that's, that's why we first construct this base case, because then it's very easy to, with respect to this base case, I make a very slight, very small perturbation in my uh, attractiveness factor. And then suddenly the optimal assortment changes drastically with a large, uh, with, with a large loss. Well, large loss. Kind of change of measure. Yeah, yeah. Understand. Yes. Okay, a few uh, more general remarks. So this is, uh, I showed this UCD policy and it achieved optimal bound. Um, as I said, this is based on an elegant idea, I believe. But there are other ideas, Thompson sampling, or just estimating these VIs by maximum likelihood estimation and then analyzing the quality of your maximum likelihood estimates. That's many things are possible. Now, also, that's also something I've already, already uh, mentioned in this context of pricing. It's nice to know square root NT, but that's just start. Uh, in many cases, there, yeah, there are no other papers than the square root and t because it's difficult to go further than that. But ideally, you want to know something about the constant before square root and t. Uh, what is like the optimal constant? Up to my knowledge, these types of problems are still open, even in the incapacitated, un unconstrained uh, assortment optimization model to say something about this. Now, also good to know the MNL model is very uh, useful if you want to include features, properties of your products or properties of your customers or both. Now, a typical example is as follows, then the purchase probability uh, of uh, purchasing product I at time T has this form. So now the valuation is some parameter theta, which now is the unknown parameter. Uh, in a product with some vector x i t, uh, which depend on the product, but also on the time, uh, so it can uh, it can model product characteristics, but also customer characteristics. You know. Now, for these types of models, uh, you have to learn theta, and you have to assume something about this uh, this axis. Like suppose the axes are customer data, uh, how the customer at time t uh, relates to feature uh, product i, 
but you can assume IRD or you can assume adversarial, something in between. That's then a tricky question. And this is very close to contextual multi arm bandit, which is uh, in many aspects like a very, I would say, ongoing research topic. Did you have a question, Victor? Because, okay. Now, one of uh, the things that people study in these models is the effect of sparsity. Because usually we know a lot about our consumers, maybe a bit too much, but do we really want to use all the data? So uh, there are several recent papers who study how you uh, deal with uh, the fact that this X is on the one hand very high dimensional, but maybe just a few factors really matter. Now, there are regularization techniques and other techniques to deal with that. And then you also basically, di basically dynamically have to determine how much this regularization parameter, uh, how much parameters do you really uh, want to incorporate? This again relates to model complexity. Oh, and a final remark uh, before we go to a brief coffee break is uh, this is just, I shared some results on the MNL model. But of course, you can repeat this exercise for all the choice models. Markov chain, mixed logit. I wouldn't do mixed logit because there are many complications always in the mixed logit. Exponomial, uh, yeah, several of these, of course, have been done or are being looked at, uh, yeah, at this moment, I would see. In all these types of choice models, you can think about how to estimate, what's the quality of your estimators, how does the quality of your estimator depend on the assortment that you have offered, how should that affect my next assortment, etc. Okay, that's what I wanted to share about data-driven assortment optimization, some recent results. Um, yes, I suggest you have a quick coffee break of say 10 minutes, um, and then we proceed and I want to briefly share some uh, current topics in revenue management and pricing data-driven research. Should we just check if there is any question before? Uh, yeah. So any question? <laughs> I don't have. No? Nothing in the chat box. All right. So we'll meet in uh, 10 minutes, you said? Yeah. All right. Yes, thanks. Yeah, so in this last part of this mini course, um, I want to share some uh, uh, some things that people are doing nowadays in uh, data-driven pricing and revenue management research. Uh, so we have looked at several models and sometimes in particular detail. This is more uh, on a high level. Um, and the goal is, well, uh, I think it's nice to get an overview of the field, what type of problems cur uh, people currently are studying. Uh, and maybe some of you are PhD students who are looking for some inspiration, what are important problems. Well, maybe this uh, list can help. Now, it's not at all a complete list. This is just uh, some things that I've picked up what people are doing and which I think are important and intriguing uh, research questions. So I think I have four, I think, of them. And I just want to mention them briefly. The first is pricing and revenue management incorporating the effect of rankings and display. Because there is a lot of uh, evidence empirical that the position where you display a product matters a lot. And this was already known for search results. If you have to click to page two, then uh, yeah, it's basically done. So you display your products in a certain order. Very often, there's, uh, I think you almost, you, I think all of you have this experience when you purchase something and you search on some website, and then there is like the standard order. And then usually you can also uh, sort on price or on some other features. Now, people investigate that in many cases, um, it of course depends on the setting, but very often people do not even change this standard order. So the order in which you display your products to your customers is also an optimization problem, which you can uh, yeah, study uh, in isolation or together with pricing. Um, so that's the ranking and display effect. 
Now it's complicated because once your customers are scrolling to your results, you create a kind of anchoring effect. That's what they understand. And then they compare to other options. So it's interesting what's the effect of this on choice models. Now you can study this if you just have a seller who displays his or her products on her own website. But the other uh, thing you can do is look at uh, third party websites, let's say comparison websites. Like in the Netherlands uh, where I live, in December, that's always the time of the year where people change their uh, healthcare insurance. Um, because yeah, you just, uh, you have a contract for uh, at least one year or multiples of a year. And in December, you can always change. So all the big companies are then advertising. Now what, there are a few, maybe, uh, I think maybe two or three, but maybe even one or two big comparison websites where they get millions of visits, where people go and then they fill in their details and then they compare uh, what they need to pay for their health insurance. Now, uh, on this website, like the first and the first three are really prominent, but sometimes it's just a difference of, uh, I don't know, 10 cents on like a monthly fee of 100 euro. So like less than 1%. What's the difference between position three and four? But that matters a lot in terms of the attention that you get. Now, my understanding is that healthcare insurance and insurance in general, they are a bit risk averse. The traditional approach to determining the premiums is uh, understanding the, the risk and the costs, and then you add a small margin. But if you think about this, yeah, if for a small, very small, uh, decrease in your premium, you can be third instead of fourth and get more attention, then I would say it's worth playing this game. Now, a similar thing happens in the Amazon buy box. Um, and so for some products on Amazon, there are third party resellers and they basically all sell the same product or a very similar product. Now, there is a particular button where you can buy it immediately on the product page. It's called the buy box. Only one seller is selected, but you can also click on like uh, something where you can view all the sellers. Now, um, there are- Somehow there's some kind of, uh, 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 so you would expect that maybe some auction would, would do a, a good job. I mean, some kind of ranking of, if you think of Google keywords, right? The, the, the way they actually rank uh, the answer to keywords is based on some quality score that they have, but also on the bids that you put, yes. a, right? So, so I would expect some kind of auction uh, mechanism, no? Yes, well, in this healthcare insurance example, uh, the, the big companies, one after another, in some uh, order, uh, just announce their premium. So there's even this game. So, so there, that's, you cannot really do an auction because they all independently just make an announcement of the premium. Although it makes sense to wait as long as possible or maybe not as long as possible because in December people are, so that's a very interesting game. So there, but in all the settings, this mechanism uh, of course makes a lot of sense, I agree. Because you, then what you want to avoid is all kinds of interesting uh, mixed equilibria. So I was telling about the buy box. Uh, there are several criteria and actually it's not disclosed, but one of the main criteria is uh, your price. So if, you're, if your price is uh, the lowest and all other things are equal, I like your, your reviewer scores, then you get the buy box. But then again, your competitor may just charge Epsilon below your price and you get this game and you get mixed Nash equilibria, which is very interesting. But that's the first thing I want to mention, uh, ranking and displays effects. I think they're very interesting and there are all kinds of settings. Uh, what I just mentioned is healthcare insurance, the game of when do you, when do you announce it? Uh, if you wait too long, then uh, yeah, you lose customers. But if you are the first to announce it, then the other firms may charge Epsilon below your price. Although they don't really do that is my, I don't know precisely why. 
Okay, there are already some papers on this if you Google uh, for another search engine. The second is pricing and learning on platforms. Now, platforms is also extremely interested because then we have buyers and sellers and a platform who is not, uh, the, the fortunes of the platform is not necessarily tied to uh, the sellers alone or the buyers alone, but to both of them. And as you all know, there are really many types of different platforms with different characteristics, with different objectives of the platforms. Um, and are the sellers competitors or are they sometimes also collaborators in some sense? This is uh, a big topic and it, I think this will get a lot of attention in the upcoming years because there are so many interesting challenges. Uh, the question of what do you display to say buyers who search for something, in what order? Uh, often there is contextual information. So there's a buyer with particular attributes. There are sellers who offer product with particular attributes. Well, then there is, the, sometimes it's a matching platform, but sometimes it's a manual display in a certain order. Yeah, is that based on similarity or I don't know, or based on what role does price play? It's very intriguing. Now, often these things, of course, are non-stationary. Things change a lot. Uh, if you think about, uh, I don't know, tourist uh, platforms, uh, yeah, the demand is really seasonal and depending on the time of the year. It really, uh, the design of the platform matters a lot. Eh? And do you care as a platform uh, really about, say, the price? Do, do you want to make your buyers happy and that they think they purchase a product at a low price or do you want to make sellers happy or is your design such that you do not really care you just want to have many transactions now in right sharing of course there are the temporal spatial issues to make it even more complicated this uh, is a topic where you can really do a lot a lot is already being done um, um, it's a very active uh, area but because of the many variants and the many complications, I think this is a very intriguing, uh, relatively new uh, topic. Uh, of course, not completely new, but many applications are new. I mean, the, four, the, the fourth theme, as you know, Arnu, is, is on modeling platforms and so on. But uh, here, the, the, the point I think you're, you're highlighting is the learning part, right? So yes, it sense that there is a learning component on top of, you know, the yes. whatever pricing or... Um, matching yes. which is already complex by itself yes thanks it is already complex but indeed what i want to highlight but maybe i didn't do that much the learning aspect uh, how do you sellers behave how do you buyers behave uh, indeed if i show a particular matching or ordering how do i learn or estimate how happy they are all these kinds of questions mm. on top of the complications of optimizing in the full information yeah. so uh, yeah um, yes, so this is a second topic that I want to mention uh, where you can do a lot without learning, but also with learning. Then the third, that's also a nice one. So we talked a lot about models. What are good models? Now, often demand is a function of price plus some noise. And we have the MNL model. There's a probability that somebody purchases something. Yeah, they are very simple models, but of course, Customers, uh, the customer journey is a very complicated journey. Uh, you all probably know examples from your own experience. Uh, you go to a website, you go to another website, you talk about things with your friends, and you change your mind. Maybe you wait a little bit in some cases because you expect a price uh, decrease. Um, well, th these effects. Reference effects, which we also discussed last time, right? that you have a price in mind, which affects the demand, how products are framed, uh, reputation effects, network effects, like uh, if all my friends have this product, then I also want to have this product or that makes my valuation for this product more uh, higher. There are countless things that you could try to model and try to learn. You, um, but that's, of course, uh, very complicated. So there is the model selection question. I mean, all these effects, say network effects or say strategic weighting. 
for all these effects, you can you, you can study them in isolation. Well, that's nice. You can give insights. Probably you can show that neglecting this particular effect uh, it can be detrimental because that usually is the case if you study it in isolation. And then you can come up with some nice uh, algorithm to learn it perhaps or uh, in case of reference effect, we saw that you can do some things that you to avoid learning with policy defined mitigate modeling error if you neglect reference effects. But the problem, of course, is yeah, I mean, you can keep going on and going on and make your model more complex. Uh, so here again, the question of model complexity is very urgent. Up to what extent uh, do we gain something? And that, of course, really is context dependent. Oh, I was looking uh, in the history books. Uh, up to my knowledge, the first paper on dynamic pricing is by uh, G.C. Evans from 1924, almost 100 years ago in, uh, in the American Mathematical Monthly. And uh, I was surprised to learn that in this first paper on dynamic pricing, he already considered these type of behavioral effects. So here's a quote, he wrote that the wholesale, numbers, uh, the wholesale lumber dealers, they tell us that when prices are going up, the demand is insatiable, but when prices go down, it is nil until the price movement stops. So what does that mean? Uh, in his model, uh, so that means something like strategic weighting or the, the opposite, uh, if prices are increasing strategically already, uh, buying earlier than you otherwise would have done because you see that prices are going up. Well, that's a typical behavioral aspect. And it's good to know that up to my knowledge, at least the first paper on dynamic pricing uh, already incorporated or had this in mind. So what Evans does is he has a continuous time model and the demand depends on the price and on the derivative of price uh, to model this. Oh, and then the fourth, um thing i want to mention if you want to study complications then this is also a nice one um what happens if all these data driven algorithms start playing against each other that is uh, a difficult question um well if you think about pricing well you, uh, you have a monopolist model i say the demand is just some function of my price now, there are papers that say, well, okay, we can say like uh, the demand is A minus B times my price, and then A and B, they are fluctuating. So that is a way of modeling that there are competitors out there or other sources that change the parameter. The problem, of course, is um, that you then assume that they're not really reacting to what you are doing, whereas in reality, they might do that. So what they are doing is, uh, is a function of what I am doing. But should I then try to learn this function? Or is that naive? Because indeed, maybe my competitor also has some complicated algorithm. Uh, sometimes he's exploring. Yeah, should I then try to understand statistically when he is exploring and when he's having a kind of his price is a function of my price? That's complicated. So one of the complications in practice, or I would say one of the challenges in practice, what should I assume about the level of sophistication of my competitor? Uh, is maybe he's just, uh, you know, his price is uh, my price minus 10%. Well, if that's the case, if I'm smart enough, uh, I can detect that and maybe I can use that to my advantage, but of course, Maybe tomorrow you will switch to another uh, policy. How do I incorporate that? And then what, what do I assume? Of course, you can study adversarial models, uh, but that often is too strong. I mean, usually your competitor is not your adversary. He's just maximizing his own profit. Well, but it's usually also maybe too weak to assume that his actions are independent of my actions. So already on the modeling side, there are many questions to be asked. Oh, and then another nice question is, suppose that all the players just ignore competition and we have a decent data-driven algorithm. 
what do we learn? Do we converge to a Nash equilibrium or do we converge to something else? Now, this is related to uh, some recent work that I did with Ali Awad and Janus Mailan and Thomas Lotz. Because, okay, maybe you can ask the question, do we learn a, a Nash equilibrium? But maybe we don't want to learn a Nash equilibrium. So a question that is inspired by um, people from um, competition regulation agencies is if algorithms can learn to form a cartel. Uh, that I think is a very nice question. Thing is this, um, if we sell products uh, and there is some competitive price or a Nash equilibrium price, nobody forbids us to price higher than this competitive price, that's okay. So supra competitive pricing is not against any competition law, but if we agree to do this, if we communicate about this, and we, that means I and a competitor, then uh, that's illegal. I can go to jail or we can get a uh, huge fines because that is considered uh, to uh, lead to, that's considered anti-competitive behavior. Now, so the question is, can algorithms learn to price super competitively without illicit communication? Uh, if you're going to send signals to each other to communicate, that's of course uh, forbidden. Now, it turns out that in several settings, this is possible. Uh, so in price or assortment settings, uh, we consider the first duopolis where there are two players. It's possible to design an algorithm that doesn't need to communicate with the other player. Now, and what happens if both players use the same kind of algorithm, then they will learn something supra competitive. So that means say prices are higher than in the Nash equilibrium and the revenues for the firms are higher than in the Nash. But if the other player uses some other algorithm that is not designed to collude, but just to price competitively, then for some class of such algorithms, we have a good performance, meaning we converge to a best response uh, to the limit price of the competing algorithm. So what is nice about this, what I like personally about this topic, is that this has direct consequences for law. Uh, because people at, uh, for example, the European Commission, they worry about the capabilities of these algorithms. And actually in economics and uh, uh, competition law uh, and competition economic circles, there's a huge debate about whether, about these questions, whether data-driven algorithms can learn to form a cartel and whether that means that the law should be changed. And uh, people have strong opinions about this, not always supported by, uh, by knowledge about algorithms. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I think based on my experience in price algorithms, well, there's quite a lot that can be done. And I think that the people that try to think about this question is the competition law, uh, yeah, equipped for algorithmic collusion. That's I think they they are thinking about a very good question. So the, the settings for this are are one where you know there's a winner takes it all, or you know everybody will get something in the sense yes, that yes. like if the winner gets it all, like is collusion. You you still can have collusion. Yes, in these cases, uh, the surplus is divided among the cartel oh, members. Right. Okay. Because they all need to have an incentive to uh, right. <laughs> to do this. Yeah. yeah. So that's one aspect of algorithms, data-driven algorithms, playing against each other. Uh, and, and this is related with law questions, legal questions, and that, of course. Uh, is related to another question, the ethical aspects or fairness aspects of data-driven algorithms. That's not necessarily uh, restricted to price algorithms, but in general, there, you all know many examples where this uh, is an issue. Uh, there are some recent studies on fairness, on price experimentation and fairness of revenue management algorithms. 
Uh, but also here there are several interesting and societally relevant questions uh, can be addressed. Now, so that's uh, my four topics. If your favorite topic is not, uh, is not listed, my apologies. Um, send me an email. I'm interested to learn more. So this is uh, ends what I wanted to share about data-driven pricing and revenue management. So let me close with by saying that this is a very nice field. Because what is nice is that uh, there are really complicated theory questions, but it's inspired by practice. And so and if technology changes, then new questions keep uh, coming from practice, uh, which are very uh, complicated often. Um, that's something that I personally like, and I think many people in the field like that a lot, the combination of uh, theory and practice. Oh, it's also a kind of meta field in the sense that it involves a lot of techniques and statistical techniques, optimization, complexity theory, analysis of algorithms, sometimes queuing theory, like in platform analysis, stochastic processes, and sometimes we take fluid limits. That's nice. And you also see that in the journals, I think all the leading journals in the field of management science and operation research nowadays have revenue management and market analytics department, which I think reflects the fact that this field has grown and is uh, in scope and uh, has many interesting contributions. So that's the end of the commercial. Um, yes, this is what I wanted to share. This also ends uh, the, this third session. There is a question I see from Aydin. Hi. Uh, hi, hi, Arnold. Um... Thank you for this uh, series of nice lectures. Uh, I, I enjoyed them. Thanks. Uh, so as maybe an additional topic, um, just like you, I, I'm, I'm a fan of uh, Jake Feldman's paper uh, where he can compares uh, machine learning with ML. Um, so I was wondering in, in the learning context, the type of models that you talked about today, in the learning context, whether uh, machine learning has been compared to structural models like the ones you presented. Uh, and, and whether that could be also a nice uh, direction. Because many of these platform companies, they're probably using machine learning type approaches and uh, more complicated structural modeling. Uh, how, how would we convince them of the value? Uh, yes. Probably not by you know uh, worst case performance uh, guarantees and things like that. Um, so, so I'm wondering your thoughts on machine learning versus structural modeling using discrete choice theory. Yes, that's a good question. So I just hope that there will be more studies like the paper by Jake Feldman and collaborators yeah. in other. Yes, because, well, personally, I think it's just uh, you need to have both. And um, I think that, well, of course, one, one topic that people will study a lot is uh, in the upcoming years is try to get more understanding on uh, machine learning algorithms from a theoretical perspective mm -hmm. and like why do this uh, sometimes surprisingly work very well um, but i also think that in many I, in many contexts and many applications just a simple model is already enough to mm -hmm. to to gain something yeah. like uh, yeah, sometimes i talk to people when they want to do something with machine learning or i don't know but in the end, the data is just has two columns. On the first column is the price, and the second is the demand. Yeah, you can put that in a neural network, or you can do uh, I don't know. Yeah. So I think very often, um, yeah, very so often the simple machine models. Learning, machine learning has the disadvantage of explainability, right? Everybody keeps talking yes. about it, so they can't really explain anything about the results. And these structural models basically start from an explanation of how the choice happened. Yes. Uh, so they're kind of approaching from the opposite angle. Maybe uh, it's possible to marry them at some point, um, especially for uh, learning purposes. Like, how do I learn how people choose uh, over time? Um, and, and I would add to that is also the fact that, I mean, you can handle environment that are changing. But with machine learning, if there's a new regulation, then suddenly you know, your, all your data is now obsolete to some extent. Now you can use sometimes exactly. some variables that mm. will kind of learn as well about that, but um, you know, that so makes- So learning may even be more effective, right? With, with the structural models. And, right. uh, and maybe that's, that's also a nice direction. Yes, I agree. Yeah, for example, 
like uh, there, there is um, well, an example is if you want to do pricing and uh, learning, but you don't want to change your price too often. So you have some constraints mm -hmm. on that. Mm -hmm. Well, there are some recent papers that study that starting from the existing results with structural models. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. it's possible. Eh? You make some adjustments, you do your analysis. So mm -hmm. in the, if you have some neural network, yes, it's, it's not so clear what you should do to incorporate this new change. So one of the advantages of just uh, a model-based approach is that you can really build upon existing ideas, existing insights, tweak it a little bit, and then uh, proceed, uh, which otherwise is sometimes, uh, I don't see how you would do that. Yeah, I, I would agree. And as a field uh, on the, and like, like yourself, I'm on more on the modeling side philosophically, uh, but uh, to actually prove that these things work, um, uh, the, the comparison with machine learning, I think, would be essential uh, for, for the wider world of practice, right? Uh, yes. And, and which is why Jake, Jake's paper is very important. Uh, yes, I agree. Uh, somebody should give him a prize. And, uh, <laughs> yes, yes. No, but I mean, I agree because like in, uh, in, the, I mean, in the real world, people don't know about operations research. They don't even know what it is. People know about the machine learning and AI and deep learning should be deep. And uh, yes, I think studies like this in, in a practical environment, a real field experiment, I think they can be really valuable. Uh, also for our own field to reflect on what we are doing, uh, what is the value of models, in which cases is it valuable? Because in some cases, of course, you can better just use some machine learning techniques. Exactly. Um, Yes, but that's a very good topic. Thanks. Thanks again. Um, great, great lectures. Any more questions? Maybe. Thank you so much, show. everyone. Really, and thank you, Arnu. Really much appreciated for all the efforts. Um, this was extremely uh, valuable and interesting. Thank you for sharing with us also the, you know, the resources, the papers, and uh, the recording will be on the website, like with other themes. And um, thank you all for joining us. And I hope to see you tomorrow uh, at the same time, 5 p.m. Beirut time. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Bye. Bye. Bye, Anna.